sound and logical. Moses. Moses. Moshe. Moses. Moshe. Musa. Moshe. Musa. Did not write no Torah. Wow. Moses said if you keep the commandments. The Avatar Moses is a mythological character based upon events that did not take place to usher in a new identity for a Canaanite subgroup who later re-identified as is ra El. One of the notable stories in this Israelite epic is the story of the blessings and the curses. Sinned against our God. And that, guess what? That's a punishment. Another word for punishment is a curse. That's right. This presentation will unpack where the source of inspiration came from that went on to inspire the writers of Deuteronomy 28, the blessing and the curses. The punishment, another word for punishment is a curse. That's right. Deuteronomy 28, 15. Bring it up. The Esau had done succession treaty and Deuteronomy 28 both deal with consequences of failing to uphold certain commitments. Known as the Vassal Treaties of Esar Had and VTE, have previously been recognized as literary model for both the curses of Deu 28. Deuteronomy 28 is a biblical chapter from the Old Testament detailing blessings for obedience to Yahweh's laws and curses for disobedience. It's part of the Mosaic Covenant and emphasizes moral and religious adherence with consequences tied to Yahweh's judgment. Now in the Esau Hadon Succession Treaty, it includes provisions for the orderly transfer of power and responsibilities of the successor. The treaty often contains clauses about penalties or repercussions for failing to fulfill obligations related to succession and governance. Now key similarities between these two. Consequences for failure. Both documents outline repercussions for failing to meet certain conditions or obligations. These oath tablets, which contain a long list of curses and warnings against breaking the oath, were most likely written in Assyria. This is the covenant that God established on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus after he'd brought his people up out of Egypt. And specifically, we're going to be looking at the ancient Near Eastern concept of a suzerain vassal treaty and talking about how that helps us understand the Mosaic Covenant. So first, let's think about the word uh, covenant. Okay, This is the word uh, berit in Hebrew. Uh, according to George Mendenhall, this is a covenant is an agreement enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance, okay? So this concept of covenant is important because the level of responsibility between people in the ancient Near East is determined by their blood relationship, okay? So that is, you know, the, the phrase blood is thicker than water is what we typically, uh, how we typically describe that in our culture. Um, and to, to establish a relationship between two unrelated parties so that they would have that responsibility toward each other they had to create a covenant, okay? So there's two main ways that you do this. The parity treaty, this is a treaty between equal parties, okay? So this would be kind of like a, a, a treaty that you would have between you know, somewhat equal nations today. And then you can do, this. that's considered a, a treaty between brothers. Uh, the second treaty is a suzerain vassal treaty. Now in this type of treaty, um, the greater party, the suzerain, gives certain benefits to a lesser party, okay, like military protection, land grants, and other things. In response, the vassal, the lesser party, owed the suzerain tribute and, quote, consummate loyalty, all right? Um, consequently, vassals could only have one suzerain, all right, because if they have another suzerain to take another lord or father, that would be treasonous, all right? So that's kind of your basic differences. Deuteronomy 28 religious and moral, focusing on the covenant between Yahweh and Israel.
sinned against our God. Right. And that, guess what? Yeah. That's a punishment. Another word for punishment is a curse. That's right. Right. Deuteronomy 28 and 15. Bring it up. Bring it up. Absolutely. We're going to show you how to get out of this curse. Esau Haddon's treaty is political and administrative, focusing on governance and succession. Nature of consequences. So Deuteronomy 28, the consequences are often supernatural or divine. So black people are, so black people are a cursed, cursed, cursed. Where the Asahadon's treaty, the consequences are practical and political, impacting governance and succession. The reason this is significant is because this covenant that, that Yahweh or God established with Israel at Mount Sinai has striking parallels with suzerain vassal treaties. Okay, so these suzerain vassal treaties, Hittite suzerain vassal treaties, um, this ancient Near Eastern people group, they, their treaties had six basic features. Okay, so a preamble that identifies a suzerain, a historical prologue that recounts the previous relationship between the parties. Covenant stipulations to which the vassal must agree, provisions for periodic reading and safekeeping of the covenant, witnesses to the covenant, and then finally blessings and curses should the vassal either keep or fail to keep the covenant. Now, the Sinaitic or the Mosaic covenant that God established with his people at Mount Sinai has all of those features, okay? And I'm just going to run real quickly through those and then we'll move on to why that's significant. So, Exodus 20, um, verse 2 records the preamble that identifies Yahweh as a suzerain. It says, I am Yahweh, your God. We have um, in the second part, Yahweh reminds the people that he rescued them from Israel, or sorry, from slavery in Egypt. That's the historical prologue that, that recounts the previous relationship between the parties. The covenant stipulations or the requirements for the relationship with Yahweh are outlined in Exodus 20 and, De and in Deuteronomy 5. That's the commandments that the people have to keep. You have provisions for storing the covenant, covenant in the tabernacle and then periodically reading it. That shows up in several places in Exodus like 24, 25, Deuteronomy 10, Deuteronomy 31. Um, Yahweh calls heaven and earth as witnesses to this covenant, Deuteronomy 4, 30, and 31. And we'll see this show up again in the prophets, right? Um, like in the prophet uh, Micah. It matters because it helps us to understand Yahweh's relationship with Israel and rescuing Israel from Egypt and entering into this covenant with them, he proclaimed himself as their suzerain, their Lord and Father. And because of that, he required their loyalty. So Yahweh says he's going to protect them and give them land, the promised land. And in response, they were supposed to be loyal and obedient to him. That meant, first of all, that they would worship only the Lord alone. And to worship anyone else would be treason, all right? And then Yahweh further outlined, outlined how the people are supposed to act in relationship to each other and in relationship to him. There's this extensive list of, of rights and responsibilities of the new children of Yahweh, how they're supposed to engage with each other, with people outside of, the, outside of Israel, and with Yahweh himself. He says, okay, this is how you are supposed to act. This is what it means to demonstrate covenant faithfulness or hesed to me. And now, it's crucial as we think about what the Old Testament law means and what the Mosaic Covenant means, it's crucial to note that this covenant is of Yahweh's own initiative. Their loyal obedience to him was required, but loyal obedience is not the basis of the covenant. The basis of the covenant is God's gracious act towards Israel, okay? And so as we move through the Old Testament, as you continue reading the Old Testament, you'll see this importance that the biblical authors placed on Israel's obedience and loyalty to Yahweh in response to his establishing himself as their suzerain. So when we read about these, the people of Israel keeping or failing to keep the covenant, we have to keep in mind that we're dealing with a suzerain vassal treaty that was established by a suzerain, Yahweh, with a lesser party, Israel, and they have certain rights and responsibilities. Now that they've been made family members, children through this covenant, they have rights and responsibilities as covenant members 
But the covenant always was, always has been, always is on Yahweh's own initiative. So the following is a Zusarain vassal treaty from Sakutu, who is the mother of Esher Haddon. And she's going to make a covenant with the people that they obey her son. And anyone who plots or schemes against their Lord should be marked, reported, or cursed by the gods. The covenant of Sakutu, the queen of Sena, king of Assyria, mother of Esar Haddon, king of Assyria, and mother of Asurbanipal, king of Assyria, was Samagamuyukin, his equal brother was Samagmetriubalit, and the rest of his brothers, with the royal seed, with the magnates, and the governors, the bearded hen, the eunuchs, the royal entourage, with the exempts, and all who enter the palace, with Assyrians high and low, Anyone who is included in this covenant which Queen Zakuta has made with the whole nation concerning her favorite grandson Asurbanipal. Any one of you who should fabricate and carry into effect an ugly, an evil thing, or a revolt against your lord Asurbanipal, king of Assyria, in your hearts conceive and put into words an ugly scheme an evil plot against your lord Asurbanipal, king of Assyria. In your hearts deliberate and formulate an ugly suggestion and evil advice for rebellion and insurrection against your lord Asurbanipal, king of Assyria, or plot with another for the murder of your lord Asurbanipal, king of Assyria, may assure Sin, Shamash, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, Mars, and Sirius, dot, dot, dot. Another one for punishment is a curse. That's right. right. Deuteronomy 28. And today we're going to be talking about his PhD dissertation, Something Old, Something Borrowed, or Something New, the relationship between the succession treaty of Esar Haddon and the curses of Deuteronomy 28 quite an extensive list of parallels between the two of them and with that being said i want to start us off with this question what exactly are the curses of deuteronomy 28 for those that may not be familiar with this wow moses said if you keep the commandments god will set you as a nation on high above all nations of the earth sis. but guess what sister there's always two sides to a story right that all these curses all these what all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee now says that's the flip side you don't do as you're told judgments curses will come upon you right. Right. 28 15. Bring it up. absolutely we're going to show you how to get out of this curse there's no doubt about it yet yeah, reverse that tape for me the book of deuteronomy yeah i mean i think a good place to start would be to talk about uh what we mean by curses in general and so curses are not really things that we find uh, in our culture today, but they were definitely prominent in the various cultures that existed in the ancient Near East. And so a simple definition for a curse would be that a curse is either a prayer or a wish to a divine being to cause something negative to happen uh, to another party. So that could be an individual or a group. Uh, I would say that within that category of curse, we have uh, two broad categories. We have conditional curses and unconditional curses. And so an unconditional curse would be uh, when nothing needs to happen in the future for that curse to be unleashed on someone. So, I mean, for example, you might just uh, be upset because someone stole something from you. So you might say, may the god Shamash cause that person to experience blindness. And so there is nothing contingent in the future. Uh, nothing needs to happen for that curse to be unleashed. Uh, the problem that the person doing the curse had with the other person, uh, that's something that's already happened. So we call that un unconditional. Uh, and then we have uh, conditional curses. Uh, and that's when it is contingent on something that needs to happen in the future. And so, for example, if we had uh, a boundary stone, and uh, we these are common in Babylon, ancient Babylon, they would mark off the uh, extreme edge of someone's field. Uh, you might have a curse on the boundary stone that says, 
if you move this boundary stone, uh, may the god Sin strike you with blindness. And so that's conditioned on someone moving the boundary stone. As long as no one moves the boundary stone, uh, then you are perfectly fine. Uh, but as soon as you uh, do that uh, contingent element, uh, then that prayer or that wish that's directed towards a divine being uh, would end up uh, coming upon you. Now, Deuteronomy or curses are found all kinds of different places in the ancient area. So I already mentioned uh, boundary stones. Uh, right. Sometimes they can be found on tombs. So if anyone opens up this tomb, uh, may this God cause bad things to happen to that individual. Uh, very frequently, they're found on monuments. So if anyone erases my name from this monument and says that someone else uh, made this monument, you know, made the gods curse this individual. Uh, but they're also uh, frequently found in treaty documents. And uh, that's why this is significant for Deuteronomy, because uh, from at least the 1960s, uh, there have been a number of scholars that have argued that Deuteronomy follows uh, a treaty structure. Uh, and usually that's connected with uh, Hittite vassal treaties. Uh, I'm not so con so much convinced about that. In fact, I'm uh, doing a paper uh, presenting that in November, and mm. I'm going to be arguing against uh, some of the parallels that people draw uh, when it comes to that. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, regardless of what one's view is on that, uh, there are elements in Deuteronomy that are very similar uh, to the kind of treaties that you find in the ancient Near East. Uh, and one of those similar elements that we have uh, is a series of curses that are found uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Now, these are conditional curses. And so that means that uh, their being unleashed would be contingent on something happening. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, they're contingent on whether or not Israel... Uh, keeps the stipulations that are found in the Deuteronomic Code. And so the Deuteronomic Code uh, is the series of laws that we have running from Deuteronomy chapter 12 all of the way to Deuteronomy chapter 26. Uh, if the nation as a whole, according to the narrative setting of Deuteronomy, uh, obeys those stipulations, they'll receive blessing. Uh, according to the narrative setting, if they disobey the stipulations as a whole, uh, then they'll experience negative consequences. And so that's what we mean when we talk about curses in Deuteronomy. It's it's there to guarantee uh, that Israel will fulfill their end of their obligation in the covenant that they, that they have with Yahweh, the God of Israel. That all these curses! And all these blessings! All these curses! All these curses! That all these curses shall come upon thee! and overtake thee. So this is Moses. Moses is talking to the children. What we'll call the JEDP theory. Uh, early at the, the turn of the century, the tw into the 20th century, um, theologians and scholars were coming up with a way of trying to figure out what source material um, contributed to the formation of what we were calling the Pentateuch. There was becoming more and perhaps even widespread disbelief that Moses could have written such a thing. And so they began to look for other ways and other sources to look for signs of development in the text. And uh, one of the ways that they did that was to deny the integrity of the text as a whole, but instead say that uh, the Pentateuch comes from several different sources one of them liked the name Yahweh, Jehovah, which is the J. Another liked the word Elohim for God. And so we see in the Pentateuch the use of both names. The idea came to them that perhaps because there are two names and perhaps more, that those are different writers and their, their works are being combined uh, by later writers, combined by the Deuteronomist, who is not Moses, but somebody who lives way later. And then way post-exilic, uh, there are a priestly faction who are then editing all of this work to bring about uh, what we call today the Pentateuch. So that was the story that was given as to how the Pentateuch came to be. It was, it, its source material was not Moses, but instead coming from different authors shaped by others before it was passed down to us in the form that it is. And here's where archaeology stepped in and gave us a big help. Um, Meredith Klein 
and others um, were looking at some of the documents that were coming out of the ancient Near East. And they began to look at what we'll call Hittite suzerain treaties. Um, these were treaties that would date back even before the time of Moses. And so this particular kind of genre, we'll call it, um, the treaty genre, the, the kind of documentation that comes between an overlord king and a vassal king. So if you came in and you conquered my territory, you might choose to allow me to continue to be king over my own land, but I would then be subject to you. So I would send my taxes to you. I would give allegiance to you. If you went to war, I went to war on your side. If someone attacked me, you provided protection for me. I became a vassal king and you were the overlord. So there would be a document, a treaty that would put together that would outline the relationship between you as conquering king and me as the vassal king. And these two kings would have cert different, uh, different goals for that um, treaty. The, the suzerain king, of course, would want to maintain a relationship of submission. He doesn't want to be going to war all the time. So he wants, if he's going to leave me in charge as a vassal king, the overlord wants my submission, but he also wants peace. And so he's hoping to develop a relationship by which I will not just try to rearm myself in order to throw off his authority. Uh, but instead, he will hope for putting together something that would maintain my submission, but also maintain peace. The vassal king then, who is the defeated king or some other smaller ru ruler, will be looking for in the relationship security. So that uh, if he's a small king and he's already lost a war to the overlord, um, he doesn't want to be fighting all the time to try to maintain his own independence. If he can get the overlord to fight his battles, you see he's in a much better shape. And so the vassal king is looking for security, for prosperity that can be handled by having a good relationship with the overlord. And uh, the suzerain is looking to maintain peace as well and the allegiance and the submission of those vassal kings. So they would put together these treaties which were designed to inspire both submission and trust in the vassal. And these treaties had a particular kind of terminology. So when the overlord began to describe what needed to happen between the overlord and the vassal, he would use phrases like, know the king. Uh, so the idea is that the vassal king would acknowledge the rightful position of the overlord. But no wasn't the only one. There was one to fear the king. And this describes the allegiance and the reverence that was due to the overlord because of his position. And the ideal relationship was to love the king. The idea here is that animosity would be buried. And now what we would have is a vassal king who loved and trusted his overlord gladly paid his um, debt in taxes to the overlord and rejoiced in the fact that prosperity and peace was now coming both ways. So in these treaties, to use the word to know or to fear or to love was to describe the relationship that was expected or hoped for between the overlord and the vassal king. Is it starting to sound interestingly familiar? Got all these curses! And all these blessings! All these curses! All these curses! The treaties had a certain design to them, a certain outline. Uh, and so they be would begin with a preamble. We would find out uh, who the overlord was. We would find out who the vassal king was. And uh, it would begin with an opening kind of praise for the power and the wisdom and the glory of that overlord. It would move then from the preamble to the historical perspective. The historical perspective would tell all the good things 
that the overlord had done for the vassal in the past. That it would move on to rules and stipulations. Um, here's what the vassal is responsible for doing, and even some what the overlord would do. There are blessings if you if you respond in obedience to the overlord and curses if you don't. Um, and we will call the gods to witness this covenant, this treaty between us. And then when you pass off the scene, when I, the vassal, pass off the scene, what will be the succession arrangements? And so the goal is that this agreement, this new treaty of friendship would last past the lives of the people who signed it uh, and be passed on to the next generation. And lo and behold, what they found was that an outline of the book of Deuteronomy would easily follow those particular traits. In other words, the genre that encompasses Deuteronomy is actually put into a form of a international suzanty, suzanty treaty <laughs> in which uh, you might see God as God praised for being the king high and lifted up over his people. And then it would move on to the next section of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 449 describes what God has done for his people already. By the time Moses is writing to that next generation as they're poised to go into the promised land, Moses stops and explains the history of what God has been doing with Israel that has brought them to that point. Then there are rules and stipulations, and a lot of Deuteronomy contains those rules that God requires as the overlord for his nation who are vassals under his authority. And then you have the passages that we would call blessings and curses. Blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. And it's interesting, for a, for a moment there, the passages are exact mirror. Preamble These are the words of the son, Mercilius, the great king, the king of Haiti land, the valiant, the favorite of the storm god, the son of Zulimpelimpias, hey, the great king, the king of Haiti land, the valiant. This is the preamble. Now let's hear it in Deuteronomy. These are the words which Moshe spoke unto all Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, according to Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahweh, who is our great king, had given in commandment unto them, Israel. Historical significance. As Siraz was the grandfather of you, Dupi Tasu, who rebelled against my father, but submitted again to my father, when the king of Nu Hasi, the land and the kings of Kinza, rebelled against my father. Aziras did not rebel, as he was bound by treaty. He remained bound by treaty. As my father fought against his enemies in the same manner for Aziras. Aziras remained loyal toward my father, and did not incite my father's anger. My father was loyal toward Asiras and his country. When your father died in accordance with your father's word, I did not drop you, since your father had mentioned to me your name with great praise. I saw after you, to be sure, you were sick and ailing, but though you were ailing, I, the son, put you in the place of your father and took your brothers and sisters and the Amaru land in oath for you. Stipulations The Witnesses
I would probably argue that maybe the second greatest discovery as far as biblical application goes is the discovery of these ancient Near East treaties and what they mean for us in our understanding of Scripture. So you're going to want to have in front of you the, uh, the sheet that says Suzerain Vassal Treaty. We have a Suzerain and Vassal here um, that are going to help us. Now, let me ask you this. When you, have you ever read Genesis 15 about dividing these animals in two and smoking fire pots and blazing torches and go, what is going on? All right? How many of you ever felt that reading Genesis 15? I have for years. And uh, today that's going to all make sense. The word of the Lord came to Abram. Notice the name, right? Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit it, my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Okay, an introduction. He says to him in verse 7, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. In the normal case of a suzerain and vassal treaty, the suzerain and vassal would walk together going through and in most cases, it was the vassal, the tacho, that made most of the vows of commitment. Now, there were vows of commitment that were made by the suzerain, things like, I promise to protect you. And if someone comes after you, they come after us. You know, there was that fatherly protection. But most of the commitment came from the subject. I'll be faithful. I'll serve you. I'll be loyal. I'll walk with you. I'll protect the nation. You know, all those kinds of things. Now, in this case, where is Abram? He's asleep over on the side. He's got this foreign view, like he's looking over at these animals lined up and cut in two. And what's passing between the animals? A smoking fire pot and a blazing torch, both representing deity. Those in the ancient Near, in the ancient near East represented God. And you could check that out. Um, these blessings and curses are designed to persuade Israel uh, to keep the terms of their covenant with God. And that takes place in Deuteronomy 31 through 34. And then there are, at the end of Deuteronomy, succession arrangements, because Moses is going to pass on the power to a Joshua and then to the elders. And so Deuteronomy 31 through 34 indicates what God has planned for the succession arrangements of his law. Now you're probably asking, why did I start out? Oh, you might ask first, what are the, where, where are the witnesses? I call upon heaven and earth. You can see it, see it in Deuteronomy chapter 4, and then you can see it in Deuteronomy 30 as well. So all the elements of a Hittite suzerain treaty are available to us in the book of Deuteronomy both in the terminology of the relationship, in the witnesses, and in the structure of Deuteronomy itself. How is the Treaty of Esarhaddon connected with Deuteronomy 28? And so I think it's best to, just to call it the Loyalty Oath of Esarhaddon. And it was published to guarantee that Ashurbanipal, the crown prince of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, uh, would ascend the throne of the Assyrian Empire at the death of his father, Esarhaddon. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why this uh, loyalty oath needed to be written. Uh, one of the reasons has to do with the fact that Ashurbanipal was not the oldest son. So he was not the first crown prince. He wasn't the first in line to be king after Esarhaddon. And so because it would be an unusual succession, uh, Esarhaddon, his father, wanted to guarantee that when he died, all of the different governors in the Assyrian Empire, all the client states, uh, would do everything that they possibly could 
to make sure that Ashurbanipal made it on the throne. And so there's some stipulations that say, you know, if you hear about conspiracies that are happening, uh, you know, people are saying negative things about Ashurbanipal, you need to report it. Uh, you need to fight on his behalf. Make sure that Ashurbanipal uh, ends up being on the throne. And so that's one reason, uh, the irregular succession. Uh, the other reason has to do uh, with the fact uh, that Esser hadn't himself had trouble when it came time for him to come to the throne of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, there were other brothers who fought against him uh, to be on the throne. And so he didn't want his son Ashurbanipal to experience uh, that same kind uh, of conflict. And so when this was uh, first published in 1958 uh, by DJ Wiseman, uh, he noted uh, a number of similarities between the parallel or between uh, the curses and the loyalty oath of Esser Haddon uh, and the curses in Deuteronomy 28. Now, the reason why there are curses in the loyalty oath of Esser Haddon, uh, number one, is to guarantee that no one would smash the copy that they have of the, of the document. And so everyone would be required to bring back uh, a tablet of the uh, of the loyalty oath of Esser Haddon, put it in the temple of their god, put it on display, uh, and that would be a reminder that you need to keep your oath of loyalty that you made to Ashurbanipal. Uh, so don't do anything. Don't don't throw it in the fire. Don't throw it in the river. Protect the document. Uh, but the other reason why there are curses is to guarantee that people will follow through on the oath that they made. So uh, everyone back then uh, in that culture uh, believed in a pantheon of gods who could really cause bad things to happen to you. And so if you feared those gods, if you had a high enough view of those gods uh, that you wouldn't want to be on the wrong side, uh, then you would make sure that you didn't get on the wrong side and that you would keep the uh, oath that you made. Now, in Deuteronomy 28, uh, like I was mentioning, he found about three main parallels between the curses. Uh, two of them, no one really considers to be that close at all. Uh, one of them, I would say the majority of scholars who work in this area would say there has to be some kind of non-coincidental relationship between uh, the two, maybe even a literary relationship between the two. Uh, and this has to do with a curse uh, in Deuteronomy 28 that talks about, you know, if you do not obey the stipulations in the Deuteronomic Code, uh, may the uh, sky above you become bronze and may the earth uh, beneath you become iron uh, instead of uh, rain, may dust fall on you, something like that. And so we've got three different elements. And in the loyalty oath of Esther Haddon, you see each of those three elements, not in the same sequence, uh, but they're right beside each other. Sinned against our God. Right. And that, guess what? Yeah. That's a punishment. Another word for punishment is a curse. That's right. Right. Deuteronomy 28, 15. Bring it up. Absolutely. We're going to show you how to get out of this curse. There's no doubt about it. Yet, yeah, read verse 15 for me. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, and verse 15. Come on. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. So God said if we didn't listen to him, watch this. To observe to do all his commandments uh -huh. and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Watch this. That all these curses. All these curses or punishments shall, shall come upon thee. Ain't overtake thee. And that's exactly what happened. Growing up in Haiti, I was taught that, I was preached that black nation, black people is being cursed by God. Don't get me wrong, as a teenager, as a young black man growing up, I believed in it because that's what most pastors preach. That's what I was taught. Fortunately, when I made it to high school, I had a great teacher. Shout out to Professor Galen Sloy. From that, I started to understand that poverty and black nation, poverty and black community, it's a handmade thing. That all these curses, all these, what? All these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, sis, that's the flip side. Jesus. You don't do as you're told. Judgments, curses will come upon you. Right. Deuteronomy 28, 15. Bring it up. Absolutely. We're going to show you how to get out of this curse. There's no doubt about it. Yet, yeah, read verse 15 from The book of Deuteronomy. People be like, you believe Hebrew Israelites is a cult? And I do. <laughs> Because it is a cult, it's a religious cult, period. There's no evidence. Descendants of the transatlantic slave trade are related to the Israelites of the Bible. So what Hebrew Israelites try to do is use Deuteronomy 28 as a DNA test. I don't know who this is for, but Deuteronomy 28 is not a prophecy. But let's say it was a prophecy. 
y'all still don't fulfill all these prophecies. Deuteronomy 28.52 says, They will besiege you within all your gates until your high and fortified walls that you trust in come down throughout your land. What walls were besieged? 28.68 says, The Lord will take you back and ship to Egypt by a route that I said you would never see again. There you will sell yourself to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will buy you. Last time I checked, African slaves weren't selling themselves. Folks were selling them. And people bought them. And, and when did we go back to Egypt? Because I got questions. Most Hebrew Israelites will tell you we was on literal ships, but we went back to metaphorical Egypt to be literally sold again. It don't make sense. Listen, I know you don't like me recently because I've been telling you the truth. Well, I got some more truth to tell you. Listen, Moses didn't write no Bible. Sorry. Wow. Moses said if you keep the commandments... Unless we go by rabbinical tradition and the Talmud, there's no evidence to say he wrote it. Furthermore, he died in a book. But then I guess Joshua wrote it. Again, we have to lean on rabbinical Talmudic tradition. Aside from that, though, this one's interesting. Stop cursing yourself. Sinned against our God. Right. And that, guess what? Yeah. That's a punishment. Another word for punishment is a curse. That's right. right. Deuteronomy 28, 15. Stop living a cursed life. It's all made up. The Exodus is made up. Moses is made up. Subsequently, Deuteronomy 28, all that stuff is made up. Big up to those people who are genuinely seeking truth, genuinely putting the pieces of the puzzle together and genuinely are not falling for the Kool-Aid. It's been a privilege to look into things afresh and to see what was missed previously. Stop allowing people to curse you and for you to believe and curse yourself. Enough love to everybody, big up, bless up, one. Sound and logical.